Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for September 7th through 13th, 2020. This is covering 3rd Nephi, chapters 1 through 7. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Uh, Jay, what are you doing? Just getting ready to feast on the word. Ah, good idea. (laughs) And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 48 minutes, 4 seconds. Very nice. And what is that daily? It would be 6 minutes, 52 seconds. Sweet. Very doable. Okay, we've got our time codes here. If you want to take a look and hit it chapter by chapter, feel free to do that. We always like to say hi to you as we visit each chapter. Yep. Now, we've also got an announcement that we made last week, and I just wanted to plug it again because I think it's a really great resource. Here in the Book of Mormon Central's Scripture app, Scripture Plus, here in the menu on the side, it has reading plans. Go check those out. They've got some in there. They'll be adding more where it will walk you through a study plan for a particular topic. I think they're really great and a fun way to liven up your scripture study. Very good. So let's jump into the scriptures today. We are starting a new book, 3rd Nephi. Well, it's new to us. Hmm. Now, what's interesting about 3rd Nephi is that it's not really called 3rd Nephi. For example, if you look at the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon— It is just called the Book of Nephi. Well, that sounds like that could be confusing. It could be confusing. And what's interesting is that the first Book of Nephi is, in fact, called the first Book of Nephi, the second Book of Nephi. But what we recognize today as third Nephi is just called the Book of Nephi. And if you look at fourth Nephi, it, too, is called the Book of Nephi. (laughs) <laughs> Why won't someone help us? <laughs> well, it would appear that Orson Pratt had that in mind when, in 1879, he put together his edition of the Book of Mormon. He added a Roman numeral to Third Nephi as a Roman numeral 3 and a Roman numeral 4 for Fourth Nephi. But one of the things that also happened because of that is that people were unclear of well, should that be read 3 Nephi or 3rd Nephi or, you know, 4 Nephi, 4th Nephi? And when James E. Talmadge put together the 1921 edition, that was then formalized as, okay, this is 3rd Nephi and 4th Nephi. So now we know. Thank you. But one of the distinctions that is from the plates, that heading, again, because that lettering is not in italics, that comes from the plates— The heading says, The book of Nephi, the son of Nephi, who was the son of Helaman, and Helaman was the son of Helaman, who was the son of Alma, who was the son of Alma, being a descendant of Nephi, who was the son of Lehi, who came out of Jerusalem in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah. So I like third Nephi better. Yeah, it kind of rolls off the tongue a little quicker. It's easier to put at the top of the page. Yes, And so that's it. And so just as a clarification, again, when you see headings like that and they're in italics, that typically means that this is something that the church added. If it's not in italics like this heading, it most likely has come from the plate itself as it has in this instance. I do like, I mean, you couldn't have a more complete answer as to who was writing this book. (laughs) Yeah, they made that very clear. Yeah, so that is, it's nice to have that expanded upon, but third Nephi for short. And so who is the author of this book? Well, it's Nephi Jr., Nephi, son of Nephi. Yep. Now remember the Nephi, his dad that we're talking about, he would have had a brother Lehi. This would be Nephi Jr. So we'll call him Nephi Jr. I would have been his uncle Lehi. So Nephi and Lehi were those two brothers that did all those amazing things we read about in Helaman. Right. And this would be the same Nephi, Nephi Sr., who called out the Gadianton robbers on their murderers and was doing all the baptizing during Samuel Samuel. the Lamanites prophesying. Right. So this is his son who's writing this book, 3rd Nephi. And interestingly enough, on the list of Nephi's that we know— he is the third Nephi. 
The first Nephi would be Nephi, son of Lehi. The second one is in the book of Helaman. And now he is the third Nephi that we're talking about. How thought-provoking. Interesting. So let's jump into the chapter. Chapter 1. So let's start at verse 1. Now it came to pass that the ninety and first year had passed away, and it was six hundred years from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem. And it was in the year that Laconius was the chief judge and the governor over the land. This is a very significant time. 600 years from the time Lehi leaves Jerusalem has been a time in which the Nephites had understood that Christ would come into the world. Mm -hmm. So this is a significant year. Verse 2, And Nephi, the son of Helaman, had departed out of the land of Zarahemla, giving charge unto his son Nephi, who was his eldest son, concerning the plates of brass and all the records which had been kept, and all those things which had been kept sacred from the departure of Lehi out of Jerusalem. Then he departed out of the land, and whither he went, no man knoweth. And his son Nephi did keep the records in his stead, yea, the record of this people. You know, it's interesting. He seemed to have prepared things for his departure. He seemed to know that he was leaving for good. Yeah, it's kind of curious. Yeah. I wonder if it's possible that he went the same way as his great-grandfather Alma. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that both had served as high priest and chief judge at the same time for a time, and both had retired the chief judgeship to focus on the church. Both had gone on a journey to a nearby city and just disappeared. Don't know. Yeah, that is interesting. So let's go on. Verse 4, And it came to pass that in the commencement of the ninety and second year, now this is the ninety and second year of the reign of the judges. This is how they're keeping their time up to this point. Behold, the prophecies of the prophets began to be fulfilled more fully. For there began to be greater signs and greater miracles wrought among the people. But there were some who began to say that the time was past for the words to be fulfilled which were spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. Yeah, see, now here's where it gets a little tricky. Here's a few things to consider. One, Samuel prophesied in the 86th year. He said, for five years more cometh. And behold, then cometh the Son of God to redeem all mankind who shall believe on his name. That's Helaman 14.2. It's been five years. You know, the 86th year, if you were to count from that time, it would be the same time in the 90 and first year. But the 90 and first year has passed away. So you've got people saying, look, we're into the next year. We're into the 90 and second year. This prophecy is not coming true. And you have other people saying, yeah, but there's two things that the believers, well, and even the unbelievers should be paying attention to. One, Samuel didn't say it's going to happen on this day at this time in this month, which would be, some people may have interpreted it that way, but the Lord almost never works that way. Notice he said, five years more cometh. Well, what does that mean, five years more? Do you mean that after the 80 and 6th year, then count five years? Or, you know, at what point are you saying five years more comes? There's some vagueness even built into that. And then we have what you read in verse 4. The prophets began to be fulfilled more fully. There are signs and wonders and greater miracles being wrought. So it's not like nothing's happening. We're obviously building to something. And even then, when it says, then cometh the Son of God to redeem all those, yeah, okay, what does that mean? Does that mean that Mary is pregnant in five years from now? Do you know what I mean? And then there's nine more months and then comes the birth. So there's lots of ways you could play what's happening here. But if you're looking for the signs, you're seeing them happen in verse four. The fig trees are putting forth their leaves, as it were. You know, things are moving forward. You can expect that something is going to happen even if it doesn't fit to what you thought the time frame should be, even based on what seemed initially like a specific prophecy. Yeah, and perhaps this would be a good time to talk about our comparison of the years of the reign of the judges to a certain year B.C. and what is going on in the old world. These are approximations, 
And I want to be clear on that. And I also want to be clear that even the markings in the Book of Mormon that were added by James E. Talmadge's project in 1921, these are approximates. We really don't know. And there is a lot of speculation. As a matter of fact, there's a fierce amount of speculation among scholars as to what year Jesus Christ was born. And we're not going to go into a whole lot of that. We are essentially going to make the assumption that he was born in the year 1 AD, and we're not really even going to talk about whether he was born on December 25th or April 6th or June 39th. We don't know. The other thing to consider in all of this is that our whole calendaring system as a whole has been really kind of iffy. If you consider the calendar that you have today, in which you have 12 months and certain days and certain months in April, June, and November, etc. This is something that the British colonies, including early United States, finally adopted in 1752. So it really wasn't that long ago. And there were other countries, uh, Russia most notably, that didn't adopt the calendar until almost exactly 100 years ago. This is not something that has been static in the history of mankind. We have gone through several calendars, and different cultures have had different calendars. Which is another point to make, is that we have no idea how the Book of Mormon calendar matches up to the Gregorian calendar. Right. You could make the assumption that they're still using the Jewish lunar calendar, as that's what Lehi would have likely used before he left. But is that true? Or would they have adopted a calendaring system to the land that they were in? Or would they have modified it over time? They obviously changed their year reckoning depending on major events. The two that we know so far, they would measure time, the years from when Lehi left Jerusalem. And then they started measuring the years of the reign of the judges. And we're going to get a new transition coming up here. So I want to make it clear that when we talk about times corresponding to events happening in the old world. This is just approximations. We really don't know. Yeah. And it's another reason why we spend a lot of time just focusing on how they calculate time as opposed to what that matches up to in another calendar system. You want to make it more relative to the group that you're talking about rather than absolute. If you want to get into it, A little bit more, if you want to hear what some scholars have had to say about various things, there's a pretty good article by John A. Tavednis at the Interpreter Foundation. We'll put a link up. It's called When Christ Was Born. I can tell you personally, having read through this, that I don't necessarily agree with all of John Tavednis' conclusions, but it's a very thorough discussion on the topic, I thought. Sounds good. To summarize... If you're really concerned about when Christ was born, the date, the year, and so on and so forth, may I recommend to you that perhaps it's more important to remember that he was, in fact, born? That's the thing that we need to keep in mind, and that's certainly the thing that we're going to be focusing on. And on a humorous note, I'd just like to add a quote that I remembered from the great Yakko Warner, who once asked the caricature of death when time began— To which he replied, I think it was a Tuesday. Very few people know that. (laughs) Going on, verse 6. And they began to rejoice over their brethren, saying, Behold, the time is past, and the words of Samuel are not fulfilled. Therefore your joy and your faith concerning this thing hath been in vain. And it came to pass that they did make a great uproar throughout the land, and the people who believed began to be very sorrowful lest by any means those things which had been spoken might not come to pass. But behold, they did watch steadfastly for that day and that night and that day which should be as one day as if there was no night, that they might know that their faith had not been vain. Now it came to pass that there was a day set apart by the unbelievers that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death what? Except the sign should come to pass, which had been given by Samuel the prophet. Okay, that's just mean-spirited. Now, let's think about this for just a minute. Let's look at this objectively. 
In the past, we have certainly had many people who have prophesied that the world was coming to an end in 1999, in 2000, in 2012, in 2016, whatever. Each time we've had a situation where someone has been so sure that this was the end of the world and we came to the year, didn't happen. Do you remember bringing a group together and saying, these people believed that the world would end and it didn't, therefore they should die. Uh, no. Is that a little extreme to you? It is to me. And especially in this situation here where the unbelievers are saying, we're going to pick an arbitrary day, just a day that, you know, we're going to stick our finger in the air and say, on this day, if the sign hasn't happened, it's too late. That's a little strange. It is, although, siding for a minute with the wicked... I know that it's tempting sometimes to do that with the Lord, to pick an arbitrary day and say, look, if I don't have an answer by this, or if I don't have an answer in this way, or if I, in other words, although it's hard to believe this reaction, these are people that are expressing the same kind of thing that we can do when we put expectations on the Lord. And then if he doesn't meet them in exactly the way we want, then all of a sudden, you know, we execute our testimonies, if you will. Yeah, that's a really good point. The, it's one something of the we things can fall that into. we should always consider when we're dealing with people, you know, it's easy for us to look at these people, these unbelievers, and think, oh my gosh, how stupid can you be? But I think one of the main purposes that Mormon has, or perhaps the Lord has, in including these people is a demonstration of what we can do. We should be holding a mirror up to ourselves and say, hey, do we do that? Yeah. Do we pick an arbitrary day and say, well, Lord, if you haven't sent an angel to confirm my testimony, then you're not there? Yeah. Or I don't believe in you or, you know, this type of thing. Yeah. We come up with a lot of interesting rules on our own. We sure do. And we want God to obey them <laughs> like petulant children. Yes, and in the popular vernacular, I would submit that God is not here for that. Yeah. So verse 10, now it came to pass that when Nephi, the son of Nephi, saw this wickedness of his people, his heart was exceedingly sorrowful. And it came to pass that he went out and bowed himself down upon the earth and cried mightily to his God in behalf of his people. Yea, those who were about to be destroyed because of their faith in the tradition of their fathers. And it came to pass that he cried mightily unto the Lord all that day. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Lift up your head, and be of good cheer. For behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given. And on the morrow come I into the world, to show unto the world that I will fulfill all that which I have caused to be spoken by the mouth of my holy prophets. Behold, I come unto my own to fulfill all things which I have made known unto the children of men from the foundation of the world, and to do the will both of the Father and of the Son, of the Father because of me, and of the Son because of my flesh. And behold, the time is at hand, and this night shall the sign be given." Well, that's amazing and interesting because people have tried to use this to make a case for when the soul enters the body. If Jesus is speaking to Nephi, then is it possible that his spirit, his soul, is not yet in the body of the infant that will be born on the next day? That's really looking at this the wrong way, I would propose. First of all, there are three members of the Godhead. And you need to understand the importance of a concept called the divine investiture of authority. This was explained very clearly by the First Presidency in 1916 and has been more recently posted. I'll put the link in the description. But it helps us to understand that the Son can speak for the Father and the Holy Ghost can speak for the Son and the Father as them, not just for them. And there's various scripture examples of that. Revelation, it's funny because in the book of Revelation, an angel appears in the first verse. But when he speaks his message to John, he speaks 
as if he was Jesus. And then John tries to bow down and worship him in chapter 22. And the angel says, oh, oh, whoa, hey, now, don't even, you're getting off the track here. I'm a servant like you. So this divine investiture of authority allows who's speaking to speak as if they were Christ because they are perfectly unified with this message. Uh, Another example is in Moses chapter 5, verse 9. It says, and in that day, the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam which beareth record of the Father and the Son, saying, I am the only begotten of the Father from the beginning. Well, is the Holy Ghost the only begotten of the Father? No. But we get so obsessed oftentimes in our doctrine with the separateness of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, that we really lose track of the oneness. And that can be a problem for us. So remember that the Godhead is one God. And so the Holy Ghost can absolutely speak in the voice of whomever, because he's perfectly unified with them to do that. Well, and here's another thought about the block that we just read. It's interesting that the unbelievers would arbitrarily choose the night that Christ was going to come as the cutoff day. (laughs) Like they were inspired. And that seems a little too coincidental to me. And I would suggest maybe a couple of things to just ponder on. One, is it possible that Satan suggested this time to the unbelievers because you couldn't do it any later than that because then it would be too late. So it's got to be tonight or nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a possibility. Or is it possible that our Heavenly Father perhaps even inspired that time in the unbelievers as a test for those who believed to test their faith? Well, and honestly, that's really my take home message from this. If God tells us something, or reveals something, and then it doesn't get fulfilled the way we imagine it to, even if the way we imagine it to seems very logical, then what do we do? When we're left on our own and we have a compelling reason to disbelieve and a compelling reason to believe, which one do we choose to pursue? That's so important because it says something about ourselves. Well, and it is very consistent with the way that the Lord has dealt with his people over time. Perhaps the most famous example of this type of thing was the birth of Jesus Christ. The people at that time, many of the people who were believers, who were members of the church, who were Jews, devout Jews, understood the Messiah to come in a certain way and at a certain presentation and to be a military conqueror. And when Jesus was presented to them and didn't meet their expectations. They rejected him. Think about how remarkably unpredictable the birth of Jesus was, you know? This was, okay, the Savior of the world is going to be born in a tiny nothing town to an unwed teenage girl. Now, not born, but she's pregnant. Everything about this looks wrong. She's pregnant before she's married. You know, maybe it looks like a cover-up. There's certainly a lot of gossiping that must be going on around the town. Why wouldn't God just send down a light from heaven and have him be born to a high-standing high priest? I don't know. The Lord tests his people always to see where their hearts are. And I think this is another example of that. Well, and that's possible, but to play devil's advocate with what you just said, it's not like the Lord didn't put a new light in the heavens. It's not like he didn't send (laughs) angels to speak to the shepherds, and not only the shepherds, but other people, as we talked about in our last lesson. People were being visited by angels and told, hey, the Savior's coming. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Just because the Lord didn't present it in the way that we were expecting it, why are we right? Yeah. What authority do we have? Not much. Fair point. But as is the case, we know, we celebrate that the sign was given after this promise that was made. The day was coming. The wicked were excited to slay the righteous, so it seems. And yet, when the sun went down, it was not dark. And that's the interesting thing to imagine. The sun actually set And yet, it was as bright as noonday. There have been a few scholars that have tried to explain why that might have happened or what could have caused that light, 
so that you could even see the sun going down and coming up, but it's still light outside. There is a good summary of these arguments in the Book of Mormon Central Know Why, number 188. And so I would check that out if you're curious about it. Understand, though, that as best as we can to try to explain how this could have happened, eh, we don't know. We weren't there. Yeah, although it must have been amazing. Oh, yeah. The people fell to the earth. You know, it's interesting. Verse 16, it has this phrase, they knew that the great plan of destruction, which they had laid for those who believed. You know, usually when we use the phrase, the great plan, it's like the great plan of happiness. You know, that God lives. That's their great plan. Man's great plan is a great plan of destruction (laughs) that they had laid for the people. Boy. So anyways, they realize that has fallen apart. And notice a quick phrase here in verse 17. In the middle of the verse, it says that all the people upon the face of the whole earth, from the west to the east, both in the land north and in the land south. Now, this phrase, the whole earth, we see this phrase differently than ancient people saw this phrase. When you read in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, when it talks about the whole earth, they're really talking about this hyperbolically, meaning they know it's not the entire planet. There's no sense of the entire planet like we think of it today. We have a very different perspective on what the whole earth means. They mean their whole land that they're familiar with. And again, I think you'll find that consistently used throughout that biblical culture. So in verse 19, it mentions how there was no darkness. It was as bright as midday. The sun did rise again in the morning. And when it set again, everything was back to normal except in verse 21 a new star did appear according to the word so my goodness incredible amazing and then satan began to send lyings forth among the people it hardened their hearts to the intent that they might not believe this is verse 22 how how is that possible You know how people say, if only they could see an angel, if only they could see the plates or whatever it is that they feel like their testimony needs. This is another evidence to the fact that that alone does not create a testimony. Our desire is a big part of how deeply we plant those things, God's word, those experiences. In verse 22 at the end, it says, "...the more part of the people did believe and were converted unto the Lord." But the fact that Satan could even get anybody to begin to doubt or question. The reason I bring it up is I think it's interesting to explore today how Satan can spread these lies to harden our hearts that we might not believe. Even when the proof of things has been staring us in the face. It's important to examine that so that we don't fall for it. Yeah, and that is a very easy trap to fall into, and it's very common today. The problem is that we come up with our own paradigm of how things should be or how things are explained, and we never have that question in our mind of, well, I've come to this conclusion. Why am I right? Or why are the people who have contributed to my conclusion, why are they right? And so what happens if something conflicts with that, you either fight it with everything you can possibly creatively imagine, or you reject it, dismiss it as not proof, when in fact it is something that you should be considering. It happens a lot. There's an interesting philosophy that I love in the sciences that says that science can never prove anything. It can only fail to disprove. And when that's used applicably, that means your mind is always open for what truth might teach you. And I think that's a really great way for us to be operating as well. God will want us to know more, more nuanced things, different things, and we need to always be open and ready for what he chooses to reveal to us. You know, that reminds me of a favorite quote of mine. This is attributed to Isaac Asimov, who says, that the most exciting word in science is not eureka, but that's weird. (laughs) I I tend to agree with that philosophy. I love it. Keep our minds open. 
to new truth. So like we said, the more part of the people were converted and believing, Nephi baptizes them and there's peace in the land. Yep. In verse 24, and there were no contentions, save it were a few that began to preach, endeavoring to prove by the scriptures that it was no more expedient to observe the law of Moses. Now in this thing, they did err, not having understood the scriptures, but it came to pass that they soon became converted and were convinced of the error which they were in. For it was made known unto them that the law was not yet fulfilled, and that it must be fulfilled in every wit. Yea, the word came unto them that it must be fulfilled, yea, that one jot or tittle should not pass away till it should all be fulfilled. Therefore in this same year were they brought to a knowledge of their error and did confess their faults. So that's good news. Well, it is good news, and thank heavens for those that are in authority to teach these things. But what a bizarre situation to be in to know that the law you're currently living is at some point in the near future going to no longer be in effect and there will be something new. And sometimes we get all so excited about that we don't want to live the current. We want to be ready or try to anticipate the new. And the fact that they were using scriptures to prove that just helps me be more and more grateful for authoritative people in the church to be able to Let us know what the Lord, that we're not led away by every wind of doctrine. Yeah, it's really important to have that central authority. It is very important because we have proven time and time again how easy it is to cherry pick and select scriptures to prove a particular point. And that's something that was happening even here 2,000 years before. Yeah. It happens a lot. Well, okay, so let's go on. In the remaining verses of chapter 1, I know we spent a lot of time on chapter 1, but guys, it's the birth of the Savior. (laughs) So we're in now the 90 and third year. We've got Gadianton robbers just beginning to show up. They're dwelling in the mountains. There's a phrase in 27, they did infest the land. And they couldn't seem to root them out of those places. And they were causing all sorts of problems. And they increased to a great degree because in verse 28, it says there were many dissenters of the Nephites who joined them. So now we've got the new generation coming up. The Lamanites had many children in 29, but they did grow up and began to wax strong in years and they became for themselves and were led away by Zoramites and the flattering words of the Gadiantans. And so now we've got an increased affliction of wickedness happening in part because of the wickedness of the rising generation who became for themselves. Once again, to coin an earlier phrase from an earlier lesson from a quote from Hugh Nibley, the Nephites problem is not the Lamanites, or in this case, their problem is not the Gadianton robbers. The problem is themselves. Yeah. From the Institute Manual, there is a great quote that I found from President Gordon B. Hinckley that is an encouragement and an admonition to the rising generation. This is from General Conference, October 2003. He says, quote, To our young people, the glorious youth of this generation, I say, be true. Hold to the faith. Stand firmly for what you know to be right. You face tremendous temptation. It comes at you in the halls of popular entertainment, on the internet, in the movies, on television, in cheap literature, and in other ways, subtle, titillating, and difficult to resist. Peer pressure may be almost overpowering. But my dear young friends, you must not give in. You must be strong. You must take the long look ahead rather than succumbing to the present seductive temptation. You are the best generation we have ever had. You know the gospel better. You are more faithful in your duties. You are stronger to face the temptations which come your way. Live by your standards. Pray for the guidance and protection of the Lord. He will never leave you alone. He will comfort you. He will sustain you. He will bless and magnify you and make your rewards sweet and beautiful. 
and you will discover that your example will attract others who will take courage from your strength, end quote. Um, the best generation we have ever had? Hey, President Hinckley, we've got feelings too. <laughs> and yet, it's true. So you're saying the truth doesn't care about my feelings? Yes. Yes, I am. Well, that's, that is absolutely true. <laughs> so, going on to the next chapter. Yeah, chapter two. Welcome to chapter two. Yeah, happy to be here. And it came to pass that thus passed away the ninety and fifth year also, and the people began to forget those signs and wonders which they had heard, and began to be less and less astonished at a sign or a wonder from heaven, insomuch that they began to be hard in their hearts and blind in their minds, and began to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. There's a pattern in that. And I'd like to point out, too, that this is a choice. We can choose to harden ourselves or to keep our ground soft so that the truths of God can sink deep. Verse 2, imagining up some vain thing in their hearts that it was wrought by men and by the power of the devil to lead away and deceive the hearts of the people. And thus did Satan get possession of the hearts of the people again, insomuch that he did blind their eyes and lead them away to believe that the doctrine of Christ was a foolish and a vain thing. And it came to pass that the people began to wax strong in wickedness and abominations. And they did not believe that there should be any more signs or wonders given. And Satan did go about leading away the hearts of the people, tempting them and causing them that they should do great wickedness in the land. You know, it is remarkably easy to disbelieve. And it's even easier when your buddies around you are disbelieving as well. There's a quote from Elder Neil A. Maxwell. This is from his book, Things As They Really Are, where he says, quote, How quickly Satan moves in, even where people have had special spiritual experiences, seeking to get people who have seen signs to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen. The adversary has a better chance to persuade us that what we believe is foolish if we worry about looking foolish in front of our fellow men, end quote. Good point. So as we look on in the chapter, in verse 5, we'll be at a hundred years had passed away. And we are given instruction that we're now going to begin to recount the years because of this major event of the birth of Jesus. Verse 8 says that the Nephites began to reckon their time from this period when the sign was given. So if we go off of the idea, again, as we talked about, this is almost a hypothetical. If we use the idea of 1 AD or AD 1, because AD stands for Anno Domini, which means Anno for annual, Domini, Lord. It means in the year of the Literally Lord. Literally the year of our Lord, yeah. Yeah. So we would say in the year of our Lord, one. So if we're going to do that, then we're somewhere if nine years had passed away. That means we're in the 10th year since the sign was given. So we might count it 8010. Regardless, the new counting system for the Nephites is now from when the sign was given of the coming of Christ. So now in verse nine, Nephi, who was the father of Nephi. So this is the Nephi senior we were talking about at the beginning. It says he did not return to the land of Zarahemla. Now, I find that interesting because more than 10 years has passed. It's been a decade. Why bring this up again? Chapter 1 told us that Nephi, the father of Nephi, had departed and nobody knew where he went. Now, when this happened to Alma, it said that the church thought maybe he'd been taken up and really no other questions are asked. But here, it doesn't say that that was the thought of the church, that he had been taken up. And again, 10 years later, they're still wondering where he was. So I have a thought. Now, I want to point out something before I give you this thought. In the episode for the beginning of Helaman, chapters one through six, in the comments on YouTube, Peggy said that she really appreciated the idea of the what ifs. And I appreciated the way she worded that because what we're doing when we explore a what if is we're not speculating on doctrine or eternal truths, 
we're pondering. We're asking questions that allow us to wonder, what if? And when we do that, it allows us to look at the scriptures through different lenses. Elder Holland talked about it in the sense, and this is why our show is called Scripture Gems, that we would hold it up like a gem, the scriptures, and turn it this way and that, and see how the light reflected as we examine it from different perspectives. So with that in mind, I have a what if. In the Nephite lands, the only shipping we really know about is off of the west coast, the west of the narrow neck. And if that's still going on, if we still have ships there, we first heard about it in Alma 63, then what if Nephi was led by the Lord and departed out of the land? And maybe he wasn't alone. Maybe somebody like Samuel the Lamanite got to go with him. I don't know. But what if they boarded a ship? And what if they sailed from the West Coast? And what if they landed on the east of the Old World? And they would have traveled from the east to get to Jerusalem. And maybe they would have arrived as wise men inquiring about where Jesus was born. And when they were told by King Herod Bethlehem, Maybe they came to him and bore gifts. Now, is this a stretch? Probably. But it's interesting to note that there's a considerable amount of time between the time Nephi left, which was before the birth of the Savior, and when the wise men arrived. So, maybe? The reason I want to give a what if to that, knowing that we're just speculating here, we're just asking what if, is the fact that they bring up a decade later, hey, where's Nephi? (laughs) You know, that's kind of strange. We don't have that for anybody else who's disappeared. They didn't say that for Alma, but they are for Nephi. He still didn't return. Well, so where did he go? Maybe he was given that privilege, but that's only to consider, only to think about. Certainly the scriptures don't say. To be very clear, The scriptures don't say what happened to Nephi. There is a lot of information that we don't have about the wise men who came to visit Jesus. Very little is given in the book of Matthew. There's a lot of traditional stuff that really has questionable basis, in fact, that have been added by people much later. This is all just speculation. But it hopefully will help get your mind thinking outside the box. Yeah. All right, moving on. So in verse 10, there's still a lot of wickedness going on, even though there's preaching and prophesying happening. And then we have the Gadianton robbers emerging again in verse 11. They spread so much death and carnage that the Lamanites and Nephites had to join together to take up arms against them. And verse 12, therefore, all the Lamanites who had become converted unto the Lord did unite. So we really kind of group them into the Nephites because Nephites and Lamanites are so much more of a, not a lineage title. The Nephites are generally those who follow the Lord and the Lamanites are generally those who reject. So it says the Nephites were threatened with utter destruction in verse 13. That's how bad things have gotten. Verse 14, the Lamanites united with the Nephites. Now those Lamanites who had become converted who had united themselves to the Nephites, were numbered among the Nephites. Then in verse 15, it says that their curse, speaking of those Lamanites who joined the church, their curse was taken from them. This is something that's probably happened multiple times because we know that a curse is a separation from God because of wickedness. And so, of course, the curse is taken from them when they become converted to the Lord, like we see in verse 12. Now, there's a phrase in here that's added that's pretty unique, and that is, their skin became white like unto the Nephites. So now we need to take that idea and try to put it in the context of the book. To do that, I'm going to recommend, if that topic is interesting to you, take a look at the video we made just on that topic, Black and White in the Book of Mormon. It examines the terms as they're used in the Book of Mormon and in the Bible and helps you to explore those ideas more deeply. So we'll leave that to you. And now in the 14th year, this is the 14th year since the sign, there was a war, it became exceedingly sore, and the people of Nephi did gain some advantage. It's interesting how it words that in 17. The people of Nephi did gain some advantage of the robbers. 
And then in 18, you get the other side of that. As things go on, it says at the end of 18, Gadiant and robbers did gain many advantages over them, the Nephites. So the Nephites did gain some advantage, but by the time we're done here, the Gadiant and robbers did gain many advantages. And so they are in a very bad state by the end of the second chapter. And that brings us to chapter three. Hello, chapter Welcome three. to chapter three. So I have to preface chapter three with a discovery that I made long ago. First of all, I have to mention that both Jay and I are big fans of the old Warner Brothers Looney Tunes cartoons. Yes, yes. I love them. And it came to me a few years ago that this letter that we're about to read from the leader of the Gadianton robbers, his name is Gideon High, reminded me of someone. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but I finally did. And it comes from an old Looney Tunes from January 1952 called Operation Rabbit. Now, I'm going to play a little clip of this here. And for our audio listeners, I apologize. I realize that this is visual, but if it helps... Just know that you're seeing Wiley e. Coyote set up a door in front of Bugs Bunny's rabbit hole. And that's where this conversation is taking place. So if you'll indulge me, here's a clip from Operation Rabbit, 1952. What's up, Doc? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Wile E. Coyote. Genius. I am not selling anything, nor am I working my way through college. I, so let's get down to cases. You are a rabbit, and I am going to eat you for supper. Now, don't try to get away. I am more muscular, more cunning, faster, and larger than you are, and I'm a genius. While you could hardly pass the entrance examinations to kindergarten. So, I'll give you the customary two minutes to say your prayers. I'm sorry, Mac. The lady of the house ain't home, and besides, we mailed you people a check last week. <laughs> Why do they always want to do it the hard way? <laughs> okay. Now, While John, you could hardly pass the entrance examinations to kindergarten. So <laughs> could there a be a one. better example of arrogance? So what does this have to do with chapter three, John? So let's read chapter three, starting in verse one. And now it came to pass that in the 16th year from the coming of Christ, Laconius, the governor of the land, received an epistle from the leader and the governor of this band of robbers. And these were the words which were written saying, Laconius, most noble and chief governor of the land, behold, I write this epistle unto you and to give unto you exceedingly great praise because of your firmness and also the firmness of your people in maintaining that which ye suppose to be your right and liberty. Yea, ye do stand well as if ye were supported by the hand of a god in the defense of your liberty and your property, and your country, or that which ye do call so. And it seemeth a pity unto me, most noble Laconius, that ye should be so foolish and vain as to suppose that ye can stand against so many brave men who are at my command, who do now at this time stand in their arms and do await with great anxiety for the word, Go down upon the Nephites and destroy them. And I, knowing of their unconquerable spirit, having proved them in the field of battle, and knowing of their everlasting hatred towards you, because of the many wrongs which ye have done unto them, therefore, if they should come down against you, they would visit you with utter destruction. Therefore, I have written this epistle, sealing it with mine own hand, feeling for your welfare." because of your firmness in that which ye believe to be right, and your noble spirit in the field of battle. Therefore I write unto you, desiring that ye would yield up unto this my people, your cities, your lands, and your possessions, 
rather than that they should visit you with a sword, and that destruction should come upon you. Or in other words, yield yourselves up unto us, and unite with us, and become acquainted with our secret works, and become our brethren, that ye may be like unto us, not our slaves, but our brethren, and partners of all our substance. And behold, I swear unto you, if ye will do this with an oath, ye shall not be destroyed. But if ye will not do this, I swear unto you with an oath, that on the morrow month I will command that my armies shall come down against you, and they shall not stay their hand, and shall spare not, but shall slay you, and shall let fall the sword upon you, even until ye shall become extinct. And behold, I am Gideon High, and I am the governor of this secret society of Gadianton, which society and the works thereof I know to be good. And they are of ancient date, and they have been handed down unto us. And I write this epistle unto you, Laconius, and I hope that ye will deliver up your lands and your possessions without the shedding of blood, that this my people may recover their rights and government, who have dissented away from you because of your wickedness in retaining from them their rights of government. And except ye do this, I will avenge their wrongs. I am Gideon High. Okay. Wow. So... Just a thought here. You've been able to compare both now. You've heard the clip from Operation (laughs) Rabbit directed by Chuck Jones. Uh, Did Chuck Jones have a Book of Mormon? You decide. (laughs) You know, I just. I've never made the comparison of Gideon High the Robber and Wiley Coyote, but you know, they've got the same level of arrogance, the same kind. There's a kindred spirit there. Yeah, right. Oh, super my geniuses. So, yes, yeah, super geniuses. So what do you do? Laconius's response in verse 11 is that he was exceedingly astonished because of the boldness. I mean, basically, Gideon High writes a letter saying, hey, give me all your stuff, you know, and uh, we don't want to have to kill you. Yeah, no, don't don't make us do that. Let's not shed blood. Just give us the stuff. And he was shocked, too, that they felt that they had been wronged. And yet, Laconius knows in verse 11, he says, they had wronged themselves by dissenting away. Yeah, there's a great phrase in that verse that he was amazed that Gideon High is threatening the people and avenging the wrongs of those that have received no wrong. Yeah, I know. You know? Wow. Okay, so verse 12 lets us know, thank you, Laconius, he did not hearken to the epistle, but instead that his people should cry unto the Lord for strength. And then he does something awesome. Verse 13, he gathers. Look at some of these words in the upcoming verses. He gathers unto one place. And then in verse 14, fortifications. And then later in 14, it says he puts guards. And then in 15, he fortifies the people spiritually by having them repent of their iniquities, cry unto the Lord. And then in 16, there are marvelous words and prophecies that Laconius gives. What a great leader to do that. And that the people should exert themselves. Those kinds of words, if you look at how they're laid out there, it's all about taking responsibility. You can't fix everything. You can't change the hearts of these people that are coming at you. But you can prepare yourself. You can gather together. You can change your heart and repent of your sins and receive God's prophecies. Exert yourself. And then notice how these righteous leaders work. In verse 17, they appoint chief captains. These are leaders. And what kinds of leaders? Well, they give us at the end of verse 18, Gidgidoni. Gidgidoni is another one of those awesome ones, like Captain Moroni or Captain Lehi or Tiancum. It says in 19 that when they're righteous, at least, they always appoint someone that had the spirit of revelation and also prophecy. And Gidgidoni was a great prophet among the people. So he preaches to them. Well, then the people are like, hey, now that we're all together, let's go invade them. Let's go attack the Gadianton robbers. 
And in verse 21, Gid Gidoni, wise and righteous, says, the Lord forbid. In other words, if they prepare themselves, the enemies of God will crash themselves upon them, their strength, their fortifications. But that protection will not be with them if they take the offensive. You know, I just want to say it's really exciting to see this story where you have not only Nephi, the son of Nephi, who really isn't talked about in this story, but he is obviously a prophet and most likely head of the church. And you have Laconius, who is prophesying. So obviously one who is very righteous and doing the best that he can. And Gid Gidoni, who is described as a prophet. We have the legislative leaders, the military leaders, the church leaders, all in harmony. Wonderful yeah. things happen when that happens. And so in verses 22 through 26, it goes on to describe the fulfillment of those commands. They gather everybody, their animals, their flocks, their resources into the land of Zarahemla. This is in verse 23. And also, so the land of Zarahemla and the land which is between the land of Zarahemla and Bountiful up until that border with the land of desolation, which as far as we know, it's on that narrow neck area. So we've got this whole space here that everyone is gathering into and they're fortifying and they're guarding. And in verse 25, it says that they dwelt in one land and in one body and they did repent. Can you imagine a more powerful thing to describe the people of God, that they could be together in one land, in one body, in one mind, if you will, and that they're repentant and their prayers are unto the Lord, that he would deliver them, all unified in these things. And they were exceedingly sorrowful that they had to do it, but they built their armor, their shields, their bucklers, which are little shields, and all that stuff after the instruction of Gid Gidoni. And that ends out chapter three. You know, we're told that particularly these moments before the coming of Christ to those in the Americas are a type of the kinds of things that we can expect before the second coming of the Savior. What do we do to prepare for imminent calamities? What do we do to prepare for the coming of the Lord? There was a quote that I found in the Institute Manual from then Elder Dallin H. Oaks. This comes from General Conference, April 2004. He says, quote, What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew that we could meet the Lord tomorrow through our premature death or his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? What accounts would we settle? What forgiveness would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? If we would do those things then, why not now? Why not seek peace while peace can be obtained? If our lamps of preparation are drawn down, let us start immediately to replenish them. We need to make both temporal and spiritual preparation for the events prophesied at the time of the second coming, and the preparation most likely to be neglected is the one less visible and more difficult, the spiritual. Are we following the Lord's command, Stand ye in holy places, and be not moved until the day of the Lord come? For behold, it cometh quickly. What are those holy places? Surely they include the temple and its covenants faithfully kept. Surely they include a home where children are treasured and parents are respected. Surely the holy places include our posts of duty assigned by priesthood authority, including missions and callings faithfully fulfilled in branches, wards, and stakes, end quote. So let's yeah. move on to chapter four. Okay, here we are in chapter four. Now, at the beginning of chapter four, the robbers do something interesting. They sally forth. Now, that's an interesting phrase. It just doesn't sound very tough. That was a cartoon from a couple of decades ago, wasn't it? Uh, Sally Forth. Yes, actually, it was a, a syndicated cartoon. So to sally means to issue or rush out as a body of troops from a fortified place to attack besiegers. In this case, they are 
issuing suddenly against those they're about to besiege. So they sallied forth from the hills and out of the mountains, and they're going to begin this process, a dangerous process, of being non-landholders so that they can flee wherever they want to now holding land. And you have to be, if you're going to be guerrilla warfare type guys, which they were, you've got to be really careful about this transition. And they do, but they start conquering land. Later in the verse, it says they began to take possession of all the lands which had been deserted. But there was no food, no beast, no game, nothing. The people had taken all their things with them. Verse 3, And the robbers could not exist, save it were in the wilderness for the want of food. For the Nephites had left their lands desolate, and had gathered their flocks and their herds and all their substance, and they were in one body. Therefore there was no chance for the robbers to plunder and to obtain food, save it were to come up in open battle against the Nephites. And the Nephites being in one body and having so great a number and having reserved for themselves provisions and horses and cattle and flocks of every kind, that they might subsist for the space of seven years, in the which time they did hope to destroy the robbers from off the face of the land. And thus the eighteenth year did pass away, and it came to pass that in the nineteenth year, Gideonhi found that it was expedient that he should go up to battle against the Nephites, for there was no way that they could subsist, save it were to plunder and rob and murder. And they durst not spread themselves upon the face of the land, insomuch that they could raise grain, lest the Nephites should come upon them and slay them. Therefore Gideonhi gave commandment unto his armies, that in this year they should go up to battle against the Nephites. Isn't that remarkable? So how long can robbers exist without someone to rob? About a year. We talked about in a previous lesson the concept of does a group that you're belonging to bring you closer to God and does it promote human flourishing? Does this sound like human flourishing to you? Isn't it remarkable that the only way they could subsist was off the labors of others? Hmm. Amazing. So their desperation, they can't even plant crops if they wanted to. They have plunged themselves into this unsafe situation. So their choices are very limited right now. And this does not sound like a good choice, but they're going to do their very best. So they come to battle. In verse 7, when Laconius and his people get to see them, It's horrifying. It says terrible was the appearance of the armies of Gideon. They were barely wearing anything. They were dyed in blood and their heads were shorn. And I mean, just imagine this horrific thing. And that was their desire to strike fear into the enemy. And it came to pass that when the armies of the Nephites, when they saw the appearance, they fell to the earth in verse eight. Now, you can imagine Gideon High's army is like, yeah. They fell to the earth. They're so scared of us. What they didn't know is that the truth was much more awful for them than they could suppose. In verse 10, they were disappointed because the Nephites did not fear them, but they did fear their God. And what they were doing, they didn't fall to the earth because they were scared. They fell to the earth to pray to their God. And when the armies of Gideon High rushed upon them, this is in verse 10, They were prepared to meet them in the strength of the Lord. They did receive them. These guys fell to the earth to access the power of God to defeat their enemies, which is really cool. And how is that a model for the rest of us? From the Institute Manual, I found a quote from Elder M. Russell Ballard. This is from October 1989 General Conference. He says, quote, Preparing ourselves and our families for the challenges of the coming years will require us to replace fear with faith. We must be able to overcome the fear of enemies who oppose and threaten us. The Lord has said, Fear not, little flock. Do good. Let earth and hell combine against you. For if ye are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. End quote. Yeah. Important Amen. thing to remember. Yeah, it is. And, you know, here they are unified together in one body. They've never been stronger, both spiritually and as a people. So starting in verse 11, we see that a massive slaughter ensues. That phrase, there never was known so great a slaughter among all the people of Lehi 
since he left Jerusalem. The last time we heard that description was in Alma 28. So this apparently is even worse than that one. The Nephites, however, prevail and chase the robbers into the borders of the wilderness. During that time, Gideonhi is slain. And now the Nephites return back to their fortifications. Remember, they've got seven years worth of supplies. So the robbers don't attack for another two years. By this time, they have a new leader. His name is Zemnariha. And he has an interesting idea. Rather than attack them, which obviously has proven to be a terrible idea, let's lay siege to them. Let's make sure they can't get out and get any food. Let's keep them from leaving. And what's funny about this plan, what do we know about who has food and who doesn't right, right now? <laughs> yeah, and who's industrious enough to grow food? They probably still got, you know, land space in there for crops and so forth. Yeah, it's probably well protected. Yeah. So, yes, they find themselves in this situation where all of a sudden they've got to figure out what to do and they lay siege. And of course, that does nothing because they have food. All right. So anytime some little group of Gadiantans, you know, go off, the Nephites are there and they slay them and they're slaying them by the thousands and tens of thousands. So the food now is becoming incredibly scarce. In verse 20, wild game became scarce. They've got no resources. They decide they've got to get out of here. And where do they want to go for safety? Well, they want to go north. If they can, again, try to maybe bridge that narrow pass, maybe they can get up to the land northward and regroup. However, Gidgadoni somehow knows what Zemnariha is doing. And so by night, he marches an army to head them off in front. And there's also, of course, an army behind and many thousands of robbers yield themselves as prisoners and the rest are slain. You can imagine people saying, please just give me some food. I'll be mm. your slave. I'll be your prisoner. Whatever. Just please feed me. <laughs> now, look at the response to this. It's remarkable. In verse 28, and their leader, Zemnariha, was taken and hanged upon a tree, yea, even upon the top thereof until he was dead. And when they hanged him until he was dead, they did fell the tree to the earth and did cry with a loud voice, saying, May the Lord preserve his people in righteousness and in holiness of heart, that they may cause to be felled to the earth all who seek to slay them because of the power and secret combinations, even as this man hath been felled to the earth. And they did rejoice and cry again with one voice, saying, May the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob protect this people in righteousness, so long as they shall call on the name of their God for protection. And it came to pass that they did break forth all as one in singing and praising their God for the great thing which he had done for them in preserving them from falling into the hands of their enemies." Yea, they did cry, Hosanna to the Most High God. And they did cry, Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, the Most High God. And their hearts were swollen with joy unto the gushing out of many tears because of the great goodness of God in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. And they knew it was because of their repentance and their humility that they had been delivered from an everlasting destruction. You know, there are very few places in the scriptures, in the Book of Mormon at least, where it talks about people crying, certainly a group of people weeping with tears. But there is no other place that you've got this expression of the gushing out of many tears than in this location in the Book of Mormon. That is incredibly emotional. So their hearts are swollen within them with joy, and it causes the gushing out of many tears. I know it may be strange to our ears, but emotionally, that's a heavy moment. And that brings us to chapter 5. All right, chapter 5. Welcome. The people are being righteous, and they're believing in the signs and the wonders. And in verse 3, therefore they did forsake all their sins and their abominations and their whoredoms and did serve God with all diligence day and night. You know, I found a quote in the Institute Manual from Elder John H. Groberg about the importance of faith in Jesus Christ. This kind of reminded me of. He says, quote, If we think deeply, 
we realize that the first principle, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, underlies all else. That is, it takes faith in Christ to repent, or be baptized, or perform any other ordinances in the gospel. Jesus made saving repentance possible, and he made baptism meaningful. If we have faith in him, we will repent and be baptized. If we do not repent or refuse to be baptized or are unwilling to keep his commandments, it is because we do not have sufficient faith in him. Thus, repentance, baptism, and all other principles and ordinances are not entirely separate, but are actually extensions of our faith in Christ. Without faith in him, we do little of eternal value. With faith in him, our lives become focused on doing things of eternal value, end quote. You know, I love how that segues into this next section because look at what they are doing that shows, because of their faith, that they are focusing on things and people in a way that demonstrates their eternal value. Verse 4, And now it came to pass that when they had taken all the robbers prisoners, insomuch that none did escape who were not slain, they did cast their prisoners into prison and did cause the word of God to be preached unto them. And as many as would repent of their sins and did enter into a covenant that they would murder no more were set at liberty. But as many as there were who did not enter into a covenant and who did still continue to have those secret murders in their hearts, yea, as many as were found breathing out threatenings against their brethren were condemned and punished according to the law. And thus they did put an end to all those wicked and secret and abominable combinations in the which there was so much wickedness and so many murders committed. Notice that eternal perspective. You wouldn't have that if the people weren't being so righteous and so unified and so faithful that they would look on their brethren who have been trying to kill them, but look at them with an eternal perspective and care about the welfare of their souls. I think that's right. Really What's awesome. the answer to keep them in prison, to torture them there? No. Yeah. We are going to preach the word of God unto them, and if they accept it and repent, we're going to let them go. Yeah. And if the message we keep seeing in these chapters in the Book of Mormon, how do you defeat your enemies? Truly, you make them your friends. And here they've done that, which is pretty great. Now, in verse 8, Mormon takes a moment to talk about himself and the record that he's keeping. Verse 8, And there had many things transpired which, in the eyes of some, would be great and marvelous. Nevertheless, they cannot all be written in this book. Yea, this book cannot contain even a hundredth part of what was done among so many people in the space of twenty and five years. But behold, there are records which do contain all the proceedings of this people, and a shorter but true account was given by Nephi. Therefore, I have made my record of these things according to the record of Nephi, which was engraven on the plates which were called the plates of Nephi. And behold, I do make the record on plates which I have made with mine own hands. And behold, I am called Mormon, being called after the land of Mormon, the land in which Alma did establish the church among the people, yea, the first church, which was established among them after their transgression. Now here we're referring to Mosiah 18, when Alma, who was a wicked priest of King Noah, became converted by Abinadi and then gathered the people in the land of Mormon, baptizing them in the waters of Mormon. And it's that establishing of the church that he's celebrating with his name. But as a side note, remember what we discovered in that episode, that it was King Noah that named the place Mormon. So I just find that humorous that when we're called Mormons today, it's based on the Book of Mormon, which is named after Mormon, who's named after the land, which got its name from King Noah. A wicked king. Yeah. So (laughs) at least thanks King Noah for that. Verse 13, Behold, I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I have been called of him to declare his word among his people that they might have everlasting life. And it hath become expedient that I, according to the will of God, that the prayers of those who have gone hence, who were the holy ones, 
should be fulfilled according to their faith, should make a record of these things which have been done. Yea, a small record of that which hath taken place from the time that Lehi left Jerusalem, even down until the present time. Therefore I do make my record from the accounts which have been given by those who were before me until the commencement of my day. And then I do make a record of the things which I have seen with mine own eyes. And I do know the record which I make to be a just and a true record. Nevertheless, there are many things which, according to our language, we are not able to write. And now I make an end of my saying, which is of myself, and proceed to give my account of the things which have been before me. I am Mormon and a pure descendant of Lehi. I have reason to bless my God and my Savior Jesus Christ that he brought our fathers out of the land of Jerusalem. And no one knew it, save it were himself and those whom he brought out of that land, and that he hath given me and my people so much knowledge unto the salvation of our souls. You know that phrase, a pure descendant, I wonder, he may be speaking literally, but I wonder if there's a metaphorical element in that too. A pure descendant meaning that he fully is behind Lehi and what he stands for. Because I don't know how important it is having this direct lineage from Lehi, especially with so many people mixed in. I wonder if that's what he's talking about. And That could be. And for anyone who has done a lot of family history work, you know that to assume direct lineage from someone 600 years ago or in case of Mormon, a <laughs> thousand years ago, right. it's kind of iffy even today. I yeah. mean the great phrase that everyone descends from Charlemagne, uh, there's some truth to that in a way. But does that make you a pure descendant? Mm. Well, and especially if we look at how the word pure is used in there, often referring to a person's spiritual condition. So at least that's a possibility. That makes more sense to me. You know, as he's speaking of lineages, he seems to introduce that to go on to talk about the blessings that are promised to the lineage of Joseph, which is Lehi's lineage, and then the house of Jacob, that they should be gathered in unto the Lord. And in verse 26, he says, And then shall they know their Redeemer, who is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then shall they be gathered in from the four quarters of the earth unto their own lands, from whence they have been dispersed. Yea, as the Lord liveth, so shall it be. Amen. A beautiful Mm -hmm. prophecy. As he's seeing this righteousness, he knows the kind of wickedness that's going to happen. He's living in the days of great wickedness, that promise of being gathered in together and purified is something that must give him a lot of hope. It should give us a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. So this brings us into chapter six. Welcome to chapter six. Yes. And in the first 11 verses, we've got the 26th year. Now remember, it's the 26th year since the sign that was given of Jesus's birth. And it's been seven years now since that big robber attack. The people had seven years of food. But as they returned to their own lands, they still had provisions left over. So life's good. There's peace. But verse 5 gives us a little ominousness. And now there was nothing in all the land to hinder the people from prospering continually, except they should fall into transgression. Dun, dun, well, let's dun. hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> So they're building new cities, they're repairing old cities, highways, continual peace. Jumping ahead, we're in the 29th year, we begin to have some pride and some persecutions. Take a look at verse 12. And the people began to be distinguished by ranks according to their riches and their chances for learning. Yea, some were ignorant because of their poverty, and others did receive great learning because of their riches. Some were lifted up in pride, and others were exceedingly humble. Some did return railing for railing, while others would receive railing, that means being yelled at, tormented, and so forth, and persecution and all manner of afflictions, and would not turn and revile again, but were humble and penitent before God. You know, it's almost like they had a choice. (laughs) It is almost like that. Do we have... The right to choose our attitude, maybe? 
From the Institute Manual, we have a quote from Elder Marvin J. Ashton. This is from October 1982 General Conference. He says, quote, Certainly one of our God-given privileges is the right to choose what our attitude will be in any given set of circumstances. We can let the events that surround us determine our actions, or we can personally take charge and rule our lives using as guidelines the principles of pure religion. Pure religion is learning the gospel of Jesus Christ and then putting it into action. Nothing will ever be of real benefit to us until it is incorporated into our own lives. End quote. We have that choice. Yeah, we've got to take responsibility for that. We can't blame other people. Or other circumstances. Right. It doesn't matter. So let's move on. Verse 14, And thus there became a great inequality in all the land, insomuch that the church began to be broken up. Yea, insomuch that in the thirtieth year the church was broken up in all the land, save it were among a few of the Lamanites who were converted unto the true faith. And they would not depart from it, for they were firm and steadfast and immovable, willing with all diligence to keep the commandments of the Lord. Go Lamanites! Yeah, that's amazing. Going on, verse 15. Now the cause of this iniquity of the people was this. Satan had got great power unto the stirring up of the people to do all manner of iniquity, and to the puffing them up with pride tempting them to seek for power and authority and riches and the vain things of the world. And thus Satan did lead away the hearts of the people to do all manner of iniquity. Therefore they had enjoyed peace but a few years. Mm. There's a quote that I found in the Institute Manual from Elder Neil A. Maxwell from his book, We Will Prove Them Herewith, where he says, quote, Surely it should give us more pause than it does to think of how casually we sometimes give to Satan, who could not control his own ego in the pre-mortal world, such awful control over our egos here. We often let the adversary do indirectly now what we refuse to let him do directly then. End quote. That's a good insight. You know, I came to a thought years ago it's amazing to me that we fought so hard in the pre-earth life for our agency, and yet now we are so anxious to give it up. Yeah. It's really amazing. Well, and it's not like they didn't know better. 17 through 26, let's summarize some of the events there. The Mormon says in 18, they did not sin ignorantly, for they knew the will of God. At the end of the verse, it says that it willfully rebel against God. Now, we've got a changeover in the government, and it just gives us a quick note to that effect. Laconius, son of Laconius, is now chief judge, and that always seems to foster some instability. With the people turning to pride and wickedness, we've got men who are inspired. They preach, they prophesy repentance, but this makes certain people angry. Who? Well, it's got... Chiefly, the chief judges, those who had been high priests, and the lawyers who are trying to silence them. They want to silence them by executing them, but they can't do that without permission. So, what do they do? Well, they execute them secretly, so that the governor, Laconius, doesn't find out about it. Because, of course, he wouldn't agree with them. And, of course, if he finds out about it later, it's too late. They're it already is executed. Too late. So now you've got people that are saying, hey, that is not fair. And they're bringing a complaint to the governor that these people have killed the prophets. They've been executed without the governor's approval. And the prideful are brought to be judged. But in verse 27, now it came to pass that those judges had many friends and kindreds. And the remainder, yea, even almost all the lawyers and the high priests did gather themselves together and unite with the kindreds of those judges who were to be tried according to the law. This doesn't sound good. And they did enter into a covenant with one another, yea, even into that covenant which was given by them of old, which covenant was given and administered by the devil to combine against all righteousness. Therefore they did combine against the people of the Lord and enter into a covenant to destroy them and to deliver those who were guilty of murder 
from the grasp of justice, which was about to be administered according to the law. And they did set at defiance the law and the rights of their country. And they did covenant one with another to destroy the governor and to establish a king over the land, that the land should no more be at liberty, but should be subject unto kings. Hey, wait a minute. Jay, didn't we do this lesson already? Oh, it seems like more than once. Yeah, this has been a real repeating theme for the last few weeks. Unfortunately, the outcome of this is going to be the worst that we've come across so far. And that brings us to Chapter 7. Welcome to Chapter 7. Yeah, welcome. I don't think you're going to enjoy your stay. (laughs) Verse 1. Now behold, Mormon says, I will show unto you that they did not establish a king over the land. But in this same year, yea, the thirtieth year, they did destroy upon the judgment seat, yea, did murder the chief judge of the land. And the people were divided one against another, and they did separate one from another into tribes. And this, by the way, is undoing the very thing that King Benjamin had done way back at the beginning of Mosiah, where he took all these tribes and united them under one name, and that was Christ. Without that... Here's what we get. Every man according to his family and his kindred and friends, and thus they did destroy the government of the land. Oh, my. Well done, guys. Verse 3, and every tribe did appoint a chief or a leader over them, and thus they became tribes and leaders of tribes. Now behold, there was no man among them, save he had much family and many kindreds and friends. Therefore... Their tribes became exceedingly great. Now all this was done, and there were no wars as yet among them. And all this iniquity had come upon the people because they did yield themselves unto the power of Satan. And the regulations of the government were destroyed because of the secret combination of the friends and kindreds of those who murdered the prophets. And they did cause a great contention in the land, insomuch that the more righteous part of the people had nearly all become wicked. Yea, there were but few righteous men among them. And thus six years had not passed away since the more part of the people had turned from their righteousness, like the dog to his vomit, or like the sow to her wallowing in the mire. The natural man is in charge. This is what it looks like. And remember the natural man, one of the great definitions the Book of Mormon gives us is man without God. This is what that looks like. It's not pretty. No. (laughs) Dog upon his vomit? No, not pretty. Verses 9 through 13, we've got a secret combination led by Jacob, King Jacob. He was one of the chiefest who had given his voice against the prophets who testified of Jesus And the people may not have been united. Now they're in these separate tribes. Isn't that weird to be at a place in the Book of Mormon for the first time where there's no centralized government? They've shattered. So the people may not be united, except in one thing. They hate the secret combination. And so everybody's against Jacob. That thing they can agree on. And so Jacob travels north. He sets up a new kingdom. He hopes to build up his forces through dissensions from the Nephites. And that brings us to verse 14. And it came to pass in the thirty and first year that they were divided into tribes, every man according to his family, kindred, and friends. Nevertheless, they had come to an agreement that they would not go to war one with another, but they were not united as to their laws and to their manner of government. For they were established according to the minds of those who were their chiefs and their leaders, But they did establish very strict laws that one tribe should not trespass against another, insomuch that in some degree they had peace in the land. Nevertheless, their hearts were turned from the Lord their God, and they did stone the prophets and did cast them out from among them. And it came to pass that Nephi, having been visited by angels and also the voice of the Lord, therefore having seen angels and being eyewitness, and having had power given unto him that he might know concerning the ministry of Christ, and also being eyewitness to their quick return from righteousness unto their wickedness and abominations, therefore being grieved for the hardness of their hearts 
and the blindness of their minds, went forth among them in that same year and began to testify boldly repentance and remission of sins through faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did minister many things unto them, and all of them cannot be written, and a part of them would not suffice. Therefore they are not written in this book. And Nephi did minister with power and with great authority. And it came to pass that they were angry with him, even because he had greater power than they. For it were not possible that they could disbelieve his words. For so great was his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ that angels did minister unto him daily. And in the name of Jesus did he cast out devils and unclean spirits, and even his brother did he raise from the dead after he had been stoned and suffered death by the people. And the people saw it and did witness of it and were angry with him because of his power, and he did also do many more miracles in the sight of the people in the name of Jesus. Wow. Isn't it interesting their response to these amazing miracles? They're angry about it. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where someone's been angry at you because the Lord has blessed you in some way because of righteous things that you've done. I'm thinking of one friend in particular. She was so mad that she wasn't blessed with the blessings that come from righteousness because she wanted to live her life her way. And it was in many ways a life of wickedness. And yet she was angry that God would bless others. And I don't know where all this is coming from. I wonder if that righteousness reminds them that they are wrong and they know better, and they don't want to be reminded of that. Well, and we'll find, again, we talked earlier in the lesson about when people create their own paradigms of how things should be, and when you are presented with something that violates that paradigm, it's a very common natural man reaction to be angry about it. And to attack it. You know, they saw all those signs and wonders earlier. And, you know, there's people alive in this time of our story who would have remembered the signs and wonders in heaven of Christ's birth. But in 18, look at the power that's given to Nephi. His dad would be so proud. For it were not possible that they could disbelieve his words. So great was his faith. It's not like they're just going to argue. They know what he's saying is true. I think his dad might have had a similar power when, remember the, in Helaman 5, when his dad went into Lamanite-controlled lands and preached, and because of the word, you know, he converted his enemy. And here it is. They may not be converted, but they can't disbelieve his words. They know what he says is true. I wonder how that discussion went down, whether it just devolved into, oh, yeah, well, you're a stupid head, right. you know, because what else are they going to say, right? What else? They're backed into yeah. a corner. Yep. Well, going on the last few verses, starting in verse 23, thus passed away the thirty and second year also, and Nephi did cry unto the people in the commencement of the thirty and third year, and he did preach unto them repentance and remission of sins. Now I would have you to remember also that there were none who were brought unto repentance who were not baptized with water. Therefore they were ordained of Nephi men unto this ministry that all such as should come unto them should be baptized with water, and this as a witness and a testimony before God and unto the people, that they had repented and received a remission of their sins. And there were many in the commencement of this year that were baptized unto repentance, and thus the more part of the year did pass away. And that brings us to the end of our lesson. Sorry to end on such a downer, but here's the good news. In our next lesson... We're going to see the Savior. He's going to visit the people of Nephi. But, of course, there's going to be a few more problems before that happens. Hey, John, do you hear that? What's that? That's next week. (laughs) Well, keep reading your scriptures, and we will look forward to talking to you more about this next lesson. Can't wait. It's the lesson we've all been waiting for. We'll talk to you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans.